Hi there, it's Kevin with Gone Rogue Games here with my top 10 list of board games for early 2020. Now this is the first one of these videos that I've ever done, so bear with me as I go down my top 10 list of games that I'm currently enjoying. And I'm sure this, this list will change quite frequently as I get more and more into the genre. A little bit of backstory about me. I started playing board games about a year and a half ago, I would say, so I'm still a little bit of a newbie uh, to the genre. Have been a Magic the Gathering player and uh, played video games like Dota and StarCraft for a long time. So I would call myself a gamer. Board games are something new though, at least in the scope of things. And I've really gotten into them in the last uh, year and a half, uh, mainly due to the board game group that we do here at Gone Rogue Games. So found some really fun people to play board games with and that really helps the experience. You have to find a good group of people to play with and that can make or break the experience. So without further ado, let's get down my top 10 list of board games for March of 2020. So starting off at my audible mention, this has just recently dropped out of my top 10 list, and it's mainly due to the fact that I don't think it has the replayability that I thought it did. I've now played this game five times. It was, I think, my second most favorite game at one point, and it's dropped all the way out of my top 10 list, and this is Wingspan. So Wingspan is one of the fastest growing games uh, according to Board Game Geek as, as far as moving up the rankings. It actually has the most uh, views and most plays of last year, so more people are searching and playing Wingspan than any other game. Wingspan is a pretty good engine build game, a good tableau builder game, kind of a, a little bit of, I wouldn't say card drafting, but kind of has that mechanism in it um, where you are collecting cards of birds and then trying to place them in your habitat. And it, it was really fun the first couple times until you started to figure it out. And there is a little bit of a kingmaker situation and variant situation that, that I've come to realize that this game is plagued by, meaning that someone can get an early game lead and then just run away, just to how the engine um, building mechanic works in Wingspan. So it is still a great game. I highly, highly recommend that you play Wingspan, but it has fallen off of my top 10 list. So now let's get to the juicy stuff. Now this is a newcomer to my top 10 list. This is Clank. Now Clank started off as a favorite of mine, and I'm just putting Clank in this list as uh, all of the, everything that, that surrounds Clank. Clank in space, Clank, uh, just the regular deck building adventure more the fantasy one, and then I really, really am enjoying Clank Legacy Acquisitions. So it's the legacy version of Clank or Clank Incorporated Legacy Acquisitions. Uh, Clank is a dungeon crawl slash deck builder. Of course, since I'm a magic player, I'm going to have a lot of overlap with deck building and card drafting, and Clank is, has a little bit of the components of those, but also has the dungeon crawl aspect where you're going, you have a, you're, you're pressing your luck, trying to go down the dungeon and pick up artifacts and treasures as victory points. And the longer you stay down in the dungeon, the more risky it becomes because you're taking clank. Clank turns into damage when your uh, clank tokens are pulled from the dragon uh, bag and how the dragon attacks is when you, people steal artifacts or different cards that are revealed from the clank deck uh, will make the dragon attack. And then when someone does leave the dungeon, uh, then it actually starts a time clock of when you have to get out. So it's a nice little fun um, press your luck deck building type game. It appeals to a, a variety of gamers, whether it be new or uh, gamers that have been in the genre for a long time. Um, and like I said, I think that the Clank Legacy Acquisitions is what uh, put this over the top into my top 10 list. You can see this box, this is our store copy, is just beat up with how many plays that this Clank has had. It gets the table a lot. Like I said, it's a very, very uh, popular game with, regardless of where you're at in your gaming experience. And I'm pretty sure that's gonna have a lot of plays this year in 2020. Alrighty, so moving on to my next one. This one's actually a roll and write. I know roll and writes are getting a, a bit of a um, both praise and there are some gamers or, or other YouTube personalities that think they're a bubble, think that they're just a fad and aren't as good as what people make them out to be. Uh, my favorite roll and write though is this one here, which is twice as clever. So there's this is the second one, the first one. Uh, which is That's So Clever, uh, runs very similar to this one. This is like La Yahtzee with strategy. So you get to roll these dice in That's So Clever, and you're trying to make patterns of uh, the, trying to fill your scorecard with different 
um, dice. So you, you roll a colored dice and then you mark off where it would go on the sheet and you're trying to fill it up and score the most points possible. I think that this is the best iteration of a roll and write. I've played many of them. I've probably played, you know, 15 to 20 roll and writes and nothing comes close to twice as clever. Uh, that's so clever is pretty good too, but twice as clever, I just think even uh, pushes it up a notch, has even more strategy and has even more way to kind of mitigate the randomness of the die rolls. So uh, even this is a dice rolling game, so variance is going to be a thing. But if you're a good experienced player and you know kind of what you're doing and, and know how to mitigate those dice rolls, you definitely have an advantage over people that either aren't very good at the game or don't know what they're doing. So I do like this game a lot uh, for a dice rolling game. It's my number nine. On to my number eight. This one is Gizmos. So Gizmos is... Uh, I would like to compare this one to kind of like Splendor. A lot of people get upset when I compare this to Splendor, but it's very, very similar to Splendor. Whereas you're getting gizmos that then add to your engine build to then help you pay for more gizmos that then add to your engine build to then get even more gizmos. And eventually when, um, I think someone has what, 12 gizmos? I can't remember what the, the, the cutoff is. Then the game ends, you score the victory points. So certain gizmos will have victory points attached to them as well as engine building. And basically it, what this is, is it's a... Uh, the resources are these little marbles. So you'll be able to pick from marbles um, that's on this big tray and then they go into your little storage and then you use those to then buy gizmos to add to your tableau. And it's just a really, really uh, well-made engine building game. Like I said, there's a lot of games like this out there. Splendor, again, would be the, the the kind of the trendsetter for the genre that I would I would really like to give credit to. But this is just a better Splendor, in my opinion. Uh, we've had a lot of fun playing Gizmos. I still do like Splendor. I think Splendor is a great introduction game. But Gizmos is far and away a better game. So I highly, highly, highly encourage you, if you like uh, games like Splendor, to pick up Gizmos. On to my number seven. Number seven has fallen down a little bit from my top 10 list, uh, just because there was a lot of great games, in my opinion, of 2019. 2018 was a great year. I don't care what anyone says. Uh, maybe it's just because it, the, the board game genre is fresh to me and I'm playing more of these games rather than some of the old classic ones. So I don't have as many to um, really reference points, but I've played over, what now, 120 games? Anyway, we'll get on to that. But anyway, this one is Altiplano. So Altiplano is a bag building game uh, where bag building is very similar to deck building, but instead of building into your deck, you're building into your bag. And Altiplano is building into these resources and then you draw from your bag and then you use those resources to uh, exchange them for other ways to gain like victory points. You do that by filling up your storehouse. You do that by getting the uh, the canoes or I, I guess just the 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 fishing um, victory points from that. And there's there's plenty other ways you can fulfill contracts. Uh, but it's a very very smart game. There's a lot of um, it's it's. I don't really know what to call this one because dice. A lot of people, when people think of this, things like a bag builder, they think of things like Quaxo Quedlinburg. Um, but and this this also doesn't utilize those. The, the bag is your resources. You also have a lot of other things you need to manage here, and mainly is is where you're going to be able to put those resources so they're going to best work for you. So I've only played this game I think three times, and it's just really hard to get to the table. I think that is what is going to um, keep this from moving up higher on my top 10 list because it does take about two hours to three hours to play. And this game is also has a big uh, like skill gap. So if you're good at Alto Plano, you're gonna have a huge edge over people that are just uh, new to it. It's very intimidating to new players as well. But this one has just blown me away all three times that I've played Alto Plano. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's delivered, had a very good experience all those times. So that's my number seven is Alto Plano. My number six is a game that I've probably played the most out of any game in board games because this is my go-to gateway game for newcomers. So if I'm ever trying to get someone hooked to the board game um, genre, and especially if I'm trying to get magic players to uh, venture into board gaming, this is my go-to game, which is Century Golem. Century Golem is the exact same as Century Spice Roads. Um, I, eventually, they're going to finish the trilogy for the Golem skim as, as well. But Century Golem and Spice Roads, Spice Roads is a trilogy. Uh, one of them is 
a deck builder. The next one, so that's Spice Roads. The next one, Eastern uh, Wonders, is a tile movement game. And then New World is a worker placement. I haven't played those two yet. I need to. As much as I played Century Golem, you'd think that I would actually get to it. Uh, short story is that a buddy owns them all, and we've just never got to them in our board game group. But Century Golem is a, a deck that I will grab, and I will bust out when we have people just checking out the, the shop if they want to just sit down and play a board game. It's a very fast game. It's a game that, of course, you're skilled at it, you're going to have an advantage, but it's not that big of an advantage. So basically, the whole idea of Century Golem is another Splendor-esque type game uh, where you are collecting resources to then uh, buy these golems. And the golems will score you victory points at the end of the game. And they will require specific resources. And these re resources have different values. Uh, the least expensive resource is going to be a yellow gem. And that upgrades into a green gem. And a green gem can upgrade into a blue gem. And then a blue gem can upgrade into a pink. And so to upgrade your gems and to trade your gems, you're going to use these merchants that are going to help you in your deck. So on your turn, you can do one of four different things. You can uh, recruit a golem. You can play a merchant card to get the resources or trade the resources from your tableau, or you can pick up your discard pile back up to your hand, or you can recruit another one of these merchants that, like, for example, this particular merchant here says trade four gems for a blue gem and a uh, pink gem. And so all the merchants are going to be net up no matter what. There's not like a, a neutral or anything like that. They're going to always give you more value if you add up like theoretically how much the gems are worth. And then you'll have a row of golems that you're going to try to actually buy and outscore your um, your opponent. So I like these type of games. I always like these like economic management games where um, you it's just all about efficiency and you know planning ahead. And Century Golem does not disappoint. It's very, very good. Uh, top six is high on my list, again, with over 100, 120 games that I've played. I really, really like Century Golem. I wouldn't be surprised if it continues to increase my list. And this would probably be my number one game that I've I've played, as far as plays are concerned. We're into you know, what, 30, 40, probably 50 plays of Century Golem at this point. Which is funny when I said Alts Plano at three was, was quite a bit. All right, on to my next one. And this one's one that I've only played a couple times as well. I think I'll play it three times. But I'm just blown away by it. I don't actually own this game. It's still here for sale at the store. I haven't cracked it because a good buddy of mine has it. And he's actually got the deluxe version of this game. And this is Coloma. So Coloma is a very fun... Um, I don't know how to say what this is. So... It's a an action selection for sure because you're you're yeah you're you're placing your guy at the selection point and it makes it very strategic because you're blind bidding on that um, there's a wheel and you put your guy there and if other you, you all do it simultaneously and if you put your guy the same place someone else does you're going to get one of the action spots so your where you go is going to have two different things that will trigger and if there's more if if you go to the place that has a majority of people there then one of those gets blocked so you can actually it, it's like you want to go for things that other people aren't going for um or at least not what the majority is going to be going for in like a what was this up to five player game so it can actually be quite competitive for those spots and there's also on the wheel there will be like a bonus that if you go there this turn it will do something extra but that will also make it more attractive for people to go there. So you have to think, uh-oh, should I go for that bonus and hope that other people don't? Uh, the thing is, all of those different action spots are going to be necessary throughout the game. And so eventually everyone's going to need to go to every one of them because you can only get the certain sort of trade uh, that happens at that uh, spot. Uh, so you just have to kind of outmaneuver your opponents. And so this game is criminally underrated. I think the Board Game Geeks is giving this the average rating of like less than six, which is a travesty. This game is just a gem. And it was one of my favorite games out of 2019. It's got that Western theme that I absolutely love. I'm not a big uh, fan of really judging games by their themes. I could be okay with, um, you know, building bushes with what, topiary, uh, rather than, you know, having this really complex theme. So, Coloma, just really, really fun game. It's got a lot of other tracks that you can move up and a city you can start to build to gain victory points. There's a lot of different outlets that you can go uh, to score victory points. And again, it's really about uh, timing and management and outmaneuvering your opponents and those type of games I absolutely enjoy. And then actually it has a little bit of a cooperative theme too because you have to get rid of the bandits and the person that actually 
uh, helps the most of get ridding the bandits during each turn will get more victory points, but there's a big cost to doing so. So yeah, Coloma, if you haven't tried this game, I highly, highly, highly recommend you check out Coloma. It is just a gem of a game, and I'm just I am just baffled why it's got such low ratings on Board Game Geek. Alrighty, so another 2019 newcomer, which just just has, has blown me away in the quality of this game. I like to call this game Terraforming Mars Light. This is Hadara. So Hadara is another uh, basically engine building game where you are utilizing cards to uh, go up on your economic track. So I don't know if you can see that there. We need to get a better job of, uh, promise you in the future we'll have better quality for showcasing these games. Uh, but anyway, each one of these colors will have a track. This is going to pay you income. Uh, so like green, for example, is going to be able to feed all the cards that you recruit. So you're going to need green. Uh, blue is going to help you unlock statues that can either help you produce um, more of your track or score victory points, or actually there's a little bit of both. The red is your military power, which helps you conquer territories, uh, which can be used for income as well as victory points. And the yellow is just pure money. So there's different strategies. This is something too, that there's a limited amount of cards. So each turn on the track is the first player is gonna pick where they start on the track and then they'll pick a card, one out of two cards. So they'll pick up two cards, choose one, and then they can either purchase it or sell it. And then you're gonna go around where everyone's going to eventually hit all these colors once. And then the cards that people didn't uh, choose out of those two are going to have another round for then to be turned over and then uh, starting the first player they can buy one of those cards so it's it's really really good uh, game as far as really watching what your opponents are doing and also uh, playing to the strengths of what's open so you don't want to be over competitive like your opponents are going a certain strategy you want to go for something else because this game is limited of what can be achieved through the cards and the, the smart player is going to win this. The one that knows that, that goes for the open strategy is going to win. And there, that's what I like about like Hadar is there isn't just like a set strategy that's going to be better than anything. It's going to be based upon the cards you A see and the cards that you see your opponents actually doing as well. And that is all going to make the make, make or break your game plan of how to out-resource uh, your opponents. So again, it's one of those that's just about um, you know management, managing your resources to uh, score the most victory points. You can kind of see a theme of of, um, of games that I enjoy. Uh, this sort of you know engine building economic games. All right, so that leads me on to my number three. Actually, that was my number three. That was my number three. We skipped one here. I'm really terrible here. Uh, let's go back to my number four. This is my number four, which could definitely go higher because this is one that I definitely need more plays. I've only played it three times. Uh, this is Great Western Trail. Great Western Trail is another, um, you, you move across the board and you uh, upgrade your tableau so you can, you can actually move across the board and do things better than you once did. This game has so much going for it. Um, there is these tiles you can place on the map that will actually make more like uh, landing spots on the map. And there are some of them that will tax your opponents if they go through your zone, they'll have to pay you. And so the option of the game is just to sell, to wrangle cows and then sell them to the market. And so you can focus on that. You can go really into the, the cow strategy of, of trying to kind of set, collect the cows and sell, sell the cows. And there's also, you could just go the, the kind of settling the West strategy. And you can even go um, like the railroad strategy of, of, of really, uh, of, you know, completing the railroads or going up the railroad track. And I've, on each of the three of the games, I actually played a different strategy and they're all very, very fun uh, to play. And this is another one that you really have to go what's open because there are a set amount of these engineers or wranglers that you can actually get. So if your opponent is like trying to monopolize one of them, uh, you're gonna need a few of each of these uh, because they do help you on, on your tableau of, of doing things better, like moving across the board better or selling your cows for more or um, making your your uh, track go up on your your um, your train. So it's you're gonna need a few of them, but if you can find something that's really open and can really monopolize the market, you can also outmaneuver your opponents and score a lot of victory points that way. So this one, again, I think is uh, just a gem of a game. It, I, I believe, is very, very high on Board Game Geek's like top 10, and it's definitely deserving 
of that top 10 spot. So I was very, very happy with Great Western Trail. I went through a bunch of games on the top 50 of, of Board Game Geek that I absolutely despise, like Scythe. I think the Scythe is absolute trash game. And, you know, I was very, very underwhelmed with a lot of these other games that were, were posted as, as these, these gems, these high up. Uh, one thing I've noticed with the average Board Game Geek uh, person is they're more really focused with themes like the how how thematic the game is and i guess that's what you can say is about scythe it's it's really the production value of scythe is very high but i was it i was the, the game's very shallow it's a it's a it's a complex game that's or a shallow game that's disguised as complex because once you play scythe which i've only played three times the first time i thought it was amazing the second time I'm like didn't i play this last time and the third one was like yep I just did everything the exact same that I did the time before and the time before that. And yeah, that's that's that. And there's also things I didn't like about Scythe, which um, was the the blind, the what I call blind combat, where you have to reveal cards that adds to your combat. This is a, me a, a mechanic that I absolutely cannot stand. And, you know, that's going to break a game for me to be in with. Anyway, this isn't talking about Scythe here. It's just talking about usually I've been very disappointed with Board Game Geek's top 10. However... Coming up on my list, there will be another one that is going to be on the top 10. Now, another game from, from 2019 that, that came out that just blew my socks off is Paladins of the West Kingdom. This is my number two game. This game gets better and better and better every time you play it. Now, I've only played this like four or five times, um, so... Who knows, maybe it will have the problem with wingspan is once you get that fourth or fifth time, you, it starts to get a little bit old. Uh, but every time I've played this game, I've gone a different route and it seemed to work out. And it's like every time I'm left with, wow, I should have done it this way instead. And it, there's a lot of depending factors on what cards are actually revealed uh, because there is these, these kind of contract cards. And they're going to give you a, a bit of a, a push in that direction because they're going to have a lot of victory points assigned to them. And oftentimes it's the first player to achieve them gets those victory points. So not only do you get those victory points for yourself, but you're going to be taking those potential victory points from your opponent. So Paladins West Games of Tableau Builder is an action selection. Um, it also has a bit of, of your, you have a deck of cards that you need to mitigate to go through um, each turn of what's going to suit you the best. So the, the, all those things are going to push you in certain directions, but really it's very versatile of where you can actually go uh, and do. So then there's a lot going on the board. You don't feel like you've ever really done everything. Um, and every game is dependent on, of course, of what cards get pulled from um, what certain uh, piles of cards. So for example, there's like these artisans you can recruit to help you build your city. There are um, the, the, the main focal point of paladins is there's different raiding factions like the Byzantines, um, the Saracens, and the Vikings. And you can convert them. You can either kill them or convert them. And there will be different strategies of why you'd want to do either one of those. So it's, and then for example, if you like recruit a Byzantine, then they might want you to kill Saracens and give you extra victory points for that. And so, so on and so forth. So this game is really, really in depth. I enjoyed playing every second of this game. It's my number two game. So that leads me to my first love. This game has been my number one since the very beginning of playing board games. It's continued to stay in my number one, and I have a hard time thinking that this game is ever going to be surpassed by another game. It also uh, kind of dismantles the whole notion that I don't like popular things, because that's what I get accused of a lot. Is of, Well, one of the things is if something is overhyped to me, of course, it'd be more critical than if it wasn't. Um, you know, hence Scythe, hence Blood Rage, hence um, a lot of the Yui or Rosenberg games that have just been kind of meh. Um, the, this game, however, is number three on Board Game Geeks, I believe. It's three or number two? I can't remember now. I think it's number three. But I think that the two above it aren't legit board games with Pandemic Legacy and Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is more like an RPG. I'm never going to like a game like that. And same thing like Pandemic Legacy. It's a one-time playthrough. So in my opinion, this is the number one board game. And I agree wholeheartedly with Board Game Geek's assessment. And this is the Terraforming Mars. So the, my one complaint about Terraforming Mars is some of the expansions just add more to a game that already has enough going for it. So my that's my beef with the expansions is they should have actually focused on the expansions. So for Venus Next, for example, it should have all been about terraforming Venus. That should have been the focal, not not let's play terraform Mars. And if you want to terraform Venus, then you can. And the same can be said about the colonies. The colonies should have required you to do things with the colonies. 
So my uh, suggestion is just buy Terraforming Mars, buy Prelude, and buy the map uh, pack. Those are the three that I think that are essential to the Terraforming Mars uh, game. And kind of leave those other expansions alone unless you have, you know, 20, 30 plus uh, games and really want to mix things up. Because I, I still think that there is enough going on in the base set of Terraforming Mars. And if you get Preludes, there's even more going on uh, for this game to be, uh, have many, 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 many plays, dozens and dozens of plays before it's going to get old. So Terraforming Mars is both a hand management game. So you draft cards. So of course that's going to appeal to a magic player. You're also going to be laying tiles, but it doesn't have a huge tile laying theme to it. Like it, it, it is, but it isn't. So you're going to be, you're laying these different ocean tiles or greenery tiles or city tiles to help you score victory points based upon what your cards are doing and to also help to terraform Mars. So there'll be these little thresholds you can hit and you can score bonuses if you're the person to actually uh, hit those thresholds. Uh, so this is a very, very strategic game, but it's not overly, you know, it's not over the top complex where it's like, oh, I can't introduce a new player and they'll just be lost. I think this has a, a very approachable um, game for intermediate new players. And it has that depth that us board gamers that have been around for a while uh, are really craving so that we can actually, you know, get the most meat out of a game. And I've played this game many, many, many times. It has not got old. Um, the, I mean, one of the other complaints is the, the 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 game itself has some pretty crummy components for a well, I think this is like a sixty dollar game, and there it's almost like you have to get second uh, so aftermarket products to 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 help this this game. Like one of them is these board frames uh, that will keep your pieces um, so they're not going everywhere. But I mean, with with that said though, this I haven't found a game quite like terraforming mars and it just just hits all the right spots it has the economic thing going for it it's got the card drafting going for it it's got the variable player powers that give you a direction it's got uh, ways to outmaneuver and um without a big take that so what we call and take that in board games is where you're playing cards to hurt other people i mean terraforming has a little tiny bit of that mainly towards other people's greeneries uh, but other than that, it's the outmaneuvering is just you want to get there before your opponent does. And so if you can see them going a certain strategy, then maybe you can you can shut them down. Because if there are there are a couple strategies that if you just let your opponents do it and go free, they're going to just run away the game. And I hate the type of games that if it's multiplayer and there's just one certain strategy that's going to you know beat anything, and you decide to be the person to stop the one player from having a monopoly on that strategy, and then player C and D just get to do their thing, and then you feel like, oh, I've had to play the controller out this entire time where everyone you know just plays solitaire. I don't like those type of games. Terraform Mars, you can still kind of shut down what if someone's going an all-in strategy without really hurting your strategy at all. So this is a very, very fun multiplayer game. It scales well with uh, two, three, four players just fine. I've even played the solo mode. I think the solo mode is very, very good. And I, I have nothing but good things to say about Terraforming Mars. So there is kind of my long-winded top 10 list. I, I'll try to be more concise and actually get more organized and do some cool things now that we have this camera. I'll be trying to do board game reviews. Um, actual reviews, not just, you know, top 10 lists in the future, maybe even some run throughs if people actually want to see this type of stuff. This is all about spreading out uh, beyond more than just magic at this Gone Road Game channel. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a, li uh, a like and a thumbs up or I guess of the same thing on YouTube. Click that bell icon, subscribe. And yeah, we'll have more board game content. If you're a patron of ours, you can actually get board games at distributor pricing. So I highly suggest you go check that out in the description below. Uh, well, it'll be interesting to see how my top 10 list changes over time as I get even more uh, ingrained into the board game community. This has been Kevin with the Gone Rogue Games here in Richfield, Utah. Thanks for watching.